Scripture reading this morning can be found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the ESV version. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Your trip on that stool if I don't move it. So we are certainly blessed to have everyone here this morning as we continue our gospel meeting. Uh, If you've been here this weekend or if you were here this morning for Bible class, Uh, You've had a chance to hear Chris speak, and you know what a a fantastic job he's doing with the theme for uh, this weekend is a common love. And just going through that song this morning will be a common joy. Uh, We are blessed to have Chris with us. Chris is the preacher for the Morrison Church of Christ uh, in Morrison, Tennessee, which is about four miles from where I grew up at. Uh, I got to know him as the preacher of the Hebron Church of Christ where Laura Beth and her family attended, where I was converted at. Uh, Owe a lot to Chris and his family. Uh, so thankful for the influence they've had on me uh, and my preaching work. Uh, they've uh, had the opportunity, the privilege, or not to stay at our house this weekend. Uh, we've been blessed to have them here. We're glad his whole family could come up, his wife, Danielle, uh, their children, Jordan, CJ, and Bennett, uh, doing a remarkable job. So thankful for uh, him being here in your attendance as well. Brother, come speak to us. Certainly is wonderful to be with you this morning. Appreciate so much everyone's attendance here. We've got a good number here, and uh, it's very encouraging to me. I have enjoyed spending time with uh, Josh and Laura Beth and Katie and Ridge, and I always enjoy getting to see them and appreciate uh, the relationship that we have had over the years and continue to have. I've mentioned several times how, how blessed I am to have my family here. You know, and it's the little things. Um, I was looking around at the auditorium just before we, I got up to speak, and I knew that this would just, uh, it would warm Danielle's heart. So I told her, you know the auditorium is not symmetrical. And so she'll spend the rest of service time here looking at the ceiling <laughs> and trying to uh, get all of her mind wrapped around the fact that the ceiling lines are not symmetrical because that's how she's wired, and I knew that. And uh, it warms my heart to be able to share that with my wife. Um, It's been a great time here. Uh, You know what the frog had to say about the relationship between time and fun? Time's fun when you're having flies. Um, um, Time does fly when you're having fun. And uh, I've enjoyed myself immensely. And it seems like, you know, we just uh, began this a few hours ago maybe, but here we are uh, on Sunday morning with just this sermon and tonight's sermon left to go. And we are talking this morning about a common joy. Uh, You remember that David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. I hope that you are filled with joy for the opportunity to be here. You know, Solomon had a lot to say about a great many things and Um, Ecclesiastes is a very rich book. And Ecclesiastes is about a man who had squandered his life away in sin, all the while knowing that he was squandering it. And he had to learn every lesson the hard way. And one of the lessons that he learned is about the vanity of human existence really at its essence. You know, we, we do a whole lot in this life and we focus on a whole lot that really isn't going to sustain us and that we can't take with us into eternity. 
And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon begins to describe the lot that you and I all have been dealt because we live upon this earth. Verse 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time for everything. And he goes on to list several things for which there is a time, some of which are very good and positive, and some of which are, are very challenging to us. And in verse 4, in particular as it relates to the theme of this lesson this morning, Solomon says, a time to weep and a time to laugh. He goes on to say, a time to mourn and a time to dance. You see, we recognize that throughout the scope of human existence, there is a time for everything. And as we look at this, we understand that really this describes really the gamut of human experience. And what we're going to see, this is going to be kind of our framework uh, for what we talk about this morning. We're going to talk about, number one, the common experience spectrum. Uh, that, that we can plot our lives based on where we are on that spectrum at any given moment in time. And it's really plotted out here before us. A time to weep and mourn, a time to laugh and dance. And as verse 1 said, these things are common to us all. Uh, there's, a, there's a season to everything, a time to every purpose under the heaven, and that applies to every single one of us. And so this morning we're going to talk about that common experience spectrum, and we're going to build off that uh, with some other things as we go through. So let's go ahead and plot this experience spectrum. On one end of it, on the far uh, uh, negative end of that spectrum, there is mourning. Uh, the word mourning, as it's used in the Old Testament, means to literally to tear the hair or to beat the breast. I have never been so full of sorrow and grief that I've wanted to rip my hair out. But I couldn't anyway if I wanted to at this moment in my life. But there have been times when I was so frustrated, when I was so overcome with maybe anger and, and, and other negative emo uh, uh, emotions about the moment that I was in, uh, that, that I beat my breast, that I beat my chest, or that I, that I slammed my fist down on the table because it seems like things weren't going the way I wanted them to. Uh, this describes a very deep-seated sorrow. This isn't just some passing blue Monday. This is deep and heartfelt grief. In the New Testament, a very similar word means to wail aloud. And we see that in John chapter 11 and verse 31. And, and we're going to look at verse 35 in just a moment. But you remember Lazarus has died and his sisters Mary and Martha are, are overcome with grief. And they are described as weeping. But the word there doesn't just mean that there's a, a, a few tears streaming down their faces. What it means instead is that they were overcome with visible grief. To sob or to wail aloud. And so on the far left end of the spectrum, you see that. As we think about this idea of mourning, th this is a grief that can be all-consuming. It, it can, as it were, overcome us. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 15, you see this kind of grief, this kind of sorrow described for us. Proverbs 15 and verse 13 says, A merry heart makes a tearful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, notice, the spirit is broken. Have you ever felt like your spirit was just broken? Do you know anybody who has felt like that? If so, then they're on the far end of the experience spectrum. They are in the lowest of the low. And now we recognize in the New Testament that from a Christian perspective, and we're going to talk about this, this has to be tempered. We can't stay at that point in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, Paul instructed the Thessalonians that they sorrow not. If we stopped there, we believe that Paul says, don't sorrow, don't have grief. No, he says, don't sorrow as others which have no hope. We're going to talk about hope this evening. See, for the Christian, there's a way out of this this deep, dark crevice of despair. 
Now as we get into this, I want to make something perfectly clear that there are those and even those in the body of Christ who suffer with clinical depression and clinical problems for which they can't just pull them or from which they can't just pull themselves out. I understand that. But for most of us, there are times when we feel the weight of grief and the weight of sorrow. And God provides for us a means out of that. And we'll talk about that as we continue this morning. Next we see in uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 4 this word, weep. The word as it shows up there means to bemoan. You're not happy about it, but it's not necessarily as deep a grief or sorrow as the other word mourn was. Its New Testament equivalent means just to shed tears, often silently. You remember in John uh, 11, as you continue, I believe that should be verse 35, it says Jesus wept. A different word from what uh, Lazarus' sisters had done. This word indicates that Jesus uh, was emotional, but not to the level, not to the degree as Mary and Martha were. Now, Now why not? Well, because Jesus knew He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, obviously. Jesus had a different perspective on it than they did. So we have this word, and and this maybe encompasses what you and I deal with sometimes. You just wake up, and the world just doesn't look as, as colorful as it does sometimes otherwise. You've got one of those days where for some reason you're just down in the dumps. You know, sometimes those things can be cyclical. It has to do with where we are in certain cycles in our lives. Sometimes it has to do with external circumstances. And things just don't seem to be going well. You have those days where maybe the alarm doesn't go off when it's supposed to. And so you get up and already you're 45 minutes behind. And then you go and, and you get in the car and you don't have enough gas. And so you've got to stop and get gas. We live out, in the, not in the middle of nowhere, but nowhere is within sight. And... Uh, we were so glad when they put a gas station out there. Man, yes, this gas station. That way I can be low on gas, but I don't have to stop in town on the way home. I can just get gas. It's literally a minute and a half down the road. When I need to get gas for the lawnmower, I don't have to drive 10 minutes to do that. Every other day they're out of gas. And so we'll stop and we'll be on fumes and you go and you get the pump and either, either there's a plastic bag over the pump already or you go to put it in your vehicle and there's just nothing there. And those kinds of days, they affect your outlook on life, don't they? Or maybe there are more pressing things that happen, and they don't just put you in the depths of despair, but your day just, and your, or maybe your, the period of your life just isn't going like it needs to go. Well, well, that's a little bit closer to the middle of that spectrum, but still it's, it's things that you and I have to deal with. Well, these things are certainly inevitable. You go to Psalm 30, and you see this described. You begin in verse number 5, he says, For his anger endures but for a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I remember Brother Bobby Liddell, and maybe you know Bobby Liddell. I don't know if he's been through this area uh, in the past, but he is uh, an instructor of the Memphis School of Preaching, was the director for a a little while, and is a a good man. And I remember he told us in, in preaching school, never make a decision, a big life decision on a blue Monday. Now, you can have blue Mondays, days where it seems like everything is is going wrong and everything is great. Maybe if you're a preacher, something didn't go well the day before, and you get up on Monday morning and you said, ah, forget it. Or maybe if you you work in in some other line of work, maybe it's not a Monday, maybe it's a, a, a blue Friday or blue Wednesday. Maybe at school you find those kinds of days, maybe in your family life. And you want to make a decision at the spur of the moment, sleep on it. It's amazing how much different things can look the next day. You see, those those shallow moments in our lives, they come and they go. Verse 6 says, In my prosperity I said, I I shall never be moved, and that's not true either. Good times come and go, and, and bad times can as well. They are temporary. They come, but they're temporary. John chapter 16, Jesus Uh, share something very similar. In John chapter 16, you can go with me to verse 20. To 22, very last saying to you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, you shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow, he says in verse 20, shall be turned into joy. 
In verse 22, he says, You now therefore have sorrow, but I'll see you again. Your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. He says, You're going to be so sorrowful at, my, at the loss of me, but don't worry, just wait a few days. It'll get better. It's also the case, as we see throughout the Old and New Testaments, that this kind of thing is very personal. I have learned in my life as a preacher that often we don't know what people are going through. As a preacher, I look out and I see all, and all kinds of faces looking back at me. Josh, you ever do this? I wonder what this one's thinking. And you look at somebody and their face looks like they are the most, in the most miserable circumstance. It looks like they're having a root canal. Some people look like that the whole service. And, you, and, and sometimes if you're not careful, you can become, and I'm not saying anybody here looks like that. If you, you know, I'm not saying that. But you look around and you can become fixated on that person. You think, what have I done wrong? Is this the worst sermon ever? And you fixate on that one person. But, but what I've learned is it might very well be the case that they look that way because of something completely unrelated to anything that's going on right now. You see, they brought baggage into the service. And that baggage is weighing them down. We just don't know what people are going through. You ever been at work and you say good morning to somebody you've said good morning to a million times. You say good morning and they say, whatever. I just got here. What did I do? Well, it's not about you, is it? There's something going on in their lives that you don't know about. See, and we all carry those things with us on occasion. You know, but we Christians are good at, at fussing and fighting in the car on the way to church on a Sunday morning. And then the moment that car gets put in park and those doors open, it smiles. <laughs> hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good. How about you? And meanwhile, in the back of our minds, there's those personal problems that we carry along with us. These things happen. They're a part of life. And they're things that are a part of the common experience spectrum. Then we become a little bit more positive in this spectrum. And we see here as you look at, again, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 4, the idea of laughter. The word laugh there gives the indication of cheerfulness. You know, that this isn't necessarily a long-term joy, but it's being happy in the moment. And certainly there are times when, when we can be happy. After all, shouldn't Christians be the happiest people in the world? I mean, when, when we as Christians walk around at work or school or, or even in services or at Walmart or wherever we go out in the world and we've got these awful frowns in our faces and we've got this cloud that hangs over us constantly, who would ever want to be a part of the body of Christ if that's what we portray it as? We should be the happiest people on earth because we're the most blessed of anybody on the face of the planet because we are in Christ. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again, I say rejoice. We'll quantify that in just a moment. But that principle is still very true. You and I ought to rejoice. We ought to be cheerful. We ought to be happy. Now, I know we can't always be that way. We've talked about two situations in which we're not. But by and large, we need to be those types of people. Proverbs 10 and verse 28, the hope of the righteous shall be glad. If you've got the hope of a Christian, let it show. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. We sing that to our children, don't we? Do we do it in our lives? Don't take yourself too seriously. I know there's lots of folks here who don't take themselves very seriously, and that's good. That's really good. Josh doesn't always take himself too seriously either, and I'm, I'm the same way. And I think there are, there's room in our Christian lives, there's room in our interactions with each other for levity, for times when we can enjoy one another and we can, we can have fun and maybe we can do some, some good-natured ribbing at each other. And, and don't take yourself too seriously. Problems arise when we do that. I remember I was in preaching school and, and there was a, a fellow preacher student and, and he believed that a preacher always needed to be serious. And everything he did was serious. And everything that, that he portrayed and every aspect of his life was always serious. He struggled to make it as a preacher. When he graduated, he went out into the world to preach and, and, and he kept wondering, why are doors constantly closed? Why, why am I having trouble at this congregation and this congregation? And that wasn't all of the reason, but good, a good part of it was he just couldn't relax. 
He couldn't be himself. He couldn't open up. Proverbs 15 and verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart has a continual feast. I love to eat. Eating makes me happy. And I believe that the Proverbs writer had that in mind in Proverbs 15. 15, hey, it's like you've always got food right in front of you if you've got a merry heart. It's like you're sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner every day. We need to live our lives best we can in that way. And we also need to have a short memory. Luke 15 is a parable of the prodigal son in, in that context. And you remember that the father went to make a feast. And the elder brother stomped his feet and crossed his arms and said, I can't believe that you would do that for this brother who's wasted his, his, his substance on riotous living. He says he wasted it on harlots. We don't know if that's true or not. And so he's, he's uh, wrinkling up his face and he's crossing his arms and he's stomping his feet. And the father says, don't you know that, that this is a, as good a reason as any to be married? Because my son, he was lost, he's found. Shouldn't we rejoice and be merry? You see, the elder brother couldn't forget all the things that had happened in the past. And he just carried those things around with him into that present situation. We've got to be people who can move on and have short memories. They say one of the greatest qualities of a quarterback is the ability to have a short memory. Man, you throw a pick six. It's the worst play in football because you throw a pick six and they score immediately, and then what do you have to come right out and do the next two, the two plays after that? Kick off and then here you are again. Here's the football. Don't throw it to the other team. You've got to have a short memory, and so do we in our lives as Christians. We've got to be people who can laugh, who can be cheerful, on occasion. Now the word dance is not the word that we would use to describe what people do today. You know, dancing as it's done today, there's a word for it in the New Testament and it's lasciviousness. The ESV translates it sensuality. That's not what we're talking about. The word here translated dance means to spring about wildly for joy. Your favorite team scores a touchdown. What do you do? <laughs> there used to be a Toyota commercial. And at the end of the Toyota commercial, the guy would jump like this. And they would freeze frame him just like that at the end of the commercial. Anybody else old enough to remember that? You remember that? Okay, that's way back when. And that he, was, he was dancing in the sense that it's used here. He was overcome with joy and it showed physically. Christians have the right to celebrate. We absolutely do. Romans 13 and verse 7. Romans uh, 12 and verse 15, Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Verse 7 of chapter 13, Give honor to whom honor is due. Praise to whom praise. We have the right to celebrate, but let's make sure we celebrate the right things. You know, we go to passages like uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6, Charity, love, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Let's be careful that we don't take our enjoyment from things that are sinful. And sometimes we can be drawn into the world to do that. And we take our enjoyment from things that are not wholesome and righteous. But we need to enjoy life. And we can do so in a way that other people see it. But I said all of this to say this. This common experience spectrum, for the Christian there is a thread that runs through it. And that thread has several names in the New Testament. Sometimes it's called peace. The peace that according to the book of Colossians rules in our hearts. Sometimes it's called contentment. Paul had learned in whatever state he was, therewith to be what? Content. If there is one thing that we need to learn in the current world in which we live, it's how to be content. The world sells us discontent. Advertising's greatest tool is to teach us to not be content. I don't know why I need a new phone. Mine works perfectly fine, but I have to have a new phone. 
Why? Well, because I'm not content. And so many times that's the problem that we deal with in life. But it's also called by this word, joy. My brethren, we mentioned this last night. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her, perfect, her perfecting work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting, lacking nothing. The idea there is you can be mourning and have joy. You can weep and have joy. You can laugh and have joy. You can dance and have joy. Joy permeates every aspect of the Christian's life, from the darkest moments in his existence to the greatest moments of his existence. You can still have joy because this joy, this contentment, this peace has nothing to do with external circumstances. It has nothing to do with how much gas is in your car. It has nothing to do with whether or not you got a raise at work. It has nothing to do with what the weather's like outside, how many people are protesting, who has nuclear weapons. It has nothing to do with any of that. Joy, contentment, and peace has to do with what you have waiting for you when life is over. That's where all of that comes from. And in the lowest points of our lives, we can still have joy. Jesus ended the Beatitudes by saying, Blessed are you and all men shall persecute you, revile you, say all manner of evil against you. He says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Really? Jesus, you're telling me just to smile away when people persecute you. No. He's saying, Find that inner contentment, that peace that passes all understanding. Find it within yourself to recognize that whether you're being burned at the stake, whether you're being laughed at at school, whether you're made to feel inadequate and small because you believe in a God who loves you and wants to save you, in all of those moments, you have salvation. And that's reason enough to rejoice. Joy, contentment, peace should be the thread that joins every moment of our common experience. But as we think about that this morning, there are a lot of Christians who don't have joy, contentment, or peace. And in the time that we have left this morning, I would like to ask ourselves two questions. Number one, what steals our joy? If the Christian should be the most joyous, content, peaceful person on the face of the planet, why are so many of us not joyous, not peaceful, not content? Number one reason might be sin. When sin creeps in, it steals our joy. It steals our contentment. David would say in Psalm 53, his great psalm, or Psalm 51 rather, his great psalm of repentance, I acknowledge my sin. My transgression is ever before me. It's always right in front of my face. It steals my joy. Have you ever been involved in sin and you knew it and you laid your head down at night and you had trouble going to sleep and you went to work and you had trouble focusing and you came home and you had trouble being the husband, wife, mother, father, son, daughter you needed to be because sin, sin was there. Sin steals joy. Suffering steals joy. Job said in, Psalm, in, in Job 7, verse 4, I'm paraphrasing, I can't get a good night's sleep. And man, Job couldn't. As he progressed farther in, in the situation that was happening to him, his family was gone, his wealth was gone, his health was gone. He couldn't have anywhere to lay down because there were sores all over his body. And he could not find peace and joy and contentment. Sometimes it's our surroundings that do that to us. You know, maybe it's where we work or where we go to school. Maybe it's our family life that steals our joy, our contentment, our peace. In Numbers chapter 13, verses 31 and 32, you remember that the spies, those spies, those ten, brought back an evil report. And in Numbers 14, the people, they mourned and they wept. Why? Because they believed the naysayers. They believed my pardon to anyone who's named Nancy. They believe the negative Nancys. 
and they bought it hook, line, and sinker. You find yourself surrounded by people who steal your peace, contentment, and joy from you. My wife, I'll brag on her for a moment, was miserable in the school system she was in. The environment that the school had created it was not wholesome. There was gossip, there was backbiting, there was animosity on every turn, and Danielle was miserable every day that she went to work. But she was paid well and she had good benefits. So what do you do? What do you do? Danielle said, I need to make a change. And so we did. We made the tough decision to take a pay cut, pay more for our benefits, so that she could go to an environment that could uplift her. Do you need to make a change in those you surround yourself with? The place you go to work? The situation you find yourself in? Sometimes we become overcome and we, we lose our joy, our peace, our contentment because we've just stood for too long bearing the weight. Be not weary in well-doing in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Sometimes just bearing the weight of the world can become too much for us to deal with. And it's just the course of time that causes that to happen. I know we have some electricians here, and you'd probably laugh at this because you're probably not this way, but, you know, I've had to do some electrical type things, and you have to work above your head a lot. Man, you work above your head too long, and, you're, you know, you can barely keep your hands up after a while. Am I just that big of a, of a wimp? Or do other people deal with that too? You know? And, and if you do anything long enough, it becomes tiresome. And that's true with bearing the weight of the world. In verse 41 of Matthew 26, Jesus looked at His disciples as He was in His lowest moment. And He said concerning them, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. They had stood too long. And they couldn't stand any longer. So what restores our joy? If there's sin in your life, it's very simple. Repent. You've got lots of folks, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, who'll say, if there's sin in your life, the way to find happiness is to just accept your sin, you know, and just embrace it. No, no. God says the only way to true peace and contentment and joy if you have sin in your life is to repent. I acknowledge my transgression, Psalm 51, 3 again, and my sin is ever before me. David was a man after God's own heart because he committed adultery, because he killed the woman's husband. Is that why he was a man after God's own heart? Because he numbered the people when God told him not to. Because he allowed Uzzah to carry the ark, though he was not qualified to do so. He touched it and he died. Is that why David was a man after God's own heart? No. There's really one reason and one reason only why David was a man after God's own heart. Because he was willing to acknowledge his faults, confront them, and change them. I acknowledge my transgression, my sin, is ever before me. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 describes godly sorrow, which brings about repentance. Something that's, that's not to be sorrowed over. But the sorrow of the world, he says, brings death. We recognize then the sorrow of God can bring about joy. Repentance. My favorite psalm, Psalm 73. You've got to put things in perspective. You've got to remember where things really shake out in the end. Asaph, the psalmist, the penman of Psalm 73, I believe, he was envious at the foolish when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He was in a place where he looked at the world and he said, I can't believe all these godless people are prospering. And he said, it was envy. I acknowledge that it was envy. How did he go get over that? How did he... Find peace and joy and contentment again. In, in verse 17 it says, Till I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. You see, he changed his perspective. He said, instead of looking at it through man's perspective, I'm going to, to adopt God's perspective. And I'm going to look at things the way God looks at them. And in doing that, I can regain my joy, 
my contentment, and my peace. Replacement. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, those ten spies brought back a negative report. Caleb and Joshua only brought back the good report. The people listened to the evil report. And God said all of those people will suffer. But Caleb, Joshua, you'll see the land. I'll give you that which you most need. Replace what was taken from you. And renewal. Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God can give us peace, joy, contentment. I want to leave you with one final thought. Because we're in a battle. A battle for your joy. You have a lot of options religiously, don't you? You could have chosen this morning to go somewhere or to tune to a channel where somebody could smile at you with a big white smile and he could tell you lots of jokes and he could make you feel really warm and fuzzy and he could give you everything that you need to sleep at night. But it would all be a lie. But you chose to come somewhere where maybe you'll be challenged. Maybe you'll be instructed to change. You see, that's not fun. It's not entertaining. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, Peter describes false teachers of his day in a very telling way. He said, Through covetous shall they with feigned words, and I love this phrase, make merchandise of you. This congregation could build a massive entertainment complex. Have softball fields. I'd love a gymnasium, a workout room, and we could give you all the things that can make you smile. But we'd need the backsides and the seats, you know. And we'd need to stop telling you things that might challenge you because we need your money. And we're going to make merchandise of you. We're going to let you pay our light bill. We're going to let you pay all of the ministers that we have that do all of the things that don't relate to the Word of God. But you see, this congregation is not going to do that. But so often we feel the need to compete with those who do. True joy doesn't come from a smiling preacher telling you, God wants you to be wealthy. Look at my boat, look at my planes. He wants us to have amazing things. You see, joy doesn't come that way. From being patted on the back. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul told Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? But here's why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. See, the problem is we as human beings, we want to be told we're okay. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be pushed to be better people. We don't want to be pushed to, to, to get rid of sin and to grow in Christ. We want somebody to come and tell us, you're just fine the way you are. But that will never bring you peace. It will never bring you contentment. It will never bring you joy. But what we labor to do is tell you if you want true joy and true peace, true contentment, true happiness and all of the things that life has to offer to you, it comes only in Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. This morning, are you a child of God? As you get your books out, as you get ready to extend the invitation and sing the song, I want you to ask yourself, 
If joy and peace and contentment are only found in Christ, am I there? If I'm not in Christ, I need to believe in Him. Then I need to change my life. Through repentance, I say this is sin and I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to change my mind and change my life. I'm going to with courage say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm going to be buried with Christ in baptism. Jesus said it very plainly, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. We're ready this morning to help you find joy and peace and contentment. But dear Christian, if you don't have joy, if you don't have contentment, if you don't have peace, what changes can we help you make so you can find it? If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to be restored, do it now as together we stand and sing.